All right, Hannah, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. I'm really excited for this one. So let's bring the commissioner in right now. Thank you. All right, guys, joining me live from Wellington is the Disability Rights Commissioner, Paula Tesserero. Paula, how are you today? Kia ora, Jade, and hi, everyone. I'm good, thank you. Uh, right right before we start, i got to ask, obviously, we're going to be talking about this sector broadly, but for you and your family, what has the last two weeks been like? Oh, like... like like for many New Zealanders, it, it's been um, interesting and challenging getting used to this new normal. Um, I've set myself up in the garage, and so I've been able to uh, work out of the garage while my husband and kids are inside. So I've got that little bit of space to you know, keep doing my job uh, and just really getting our heads around, um, you know, what what this is but you know i'm i'm really acutely aware that for many people right now this is uh, particularly challenging and and that's what i've really been focused on excellent thank you for that and, and as i said again we hope you're well and we hope you stay well um <laughs> we have quite a number of international guests on this twitch show here so for those that may not know can you describe for us your role as Disability Rights Commissioner, uh, broadly speaking, and then what your function is with the COVID-19 response? Sure. So my role under the Human Rights Act is, broadly speaking, to protect and promote the rights of disabled New Zealanders. And so I've got a range of levers um, with which to execute that role. And in relation to this COVID-19 situation, Broadly speaking, there's, there's sort of three roles. One is advising government, so making sure that government is aware of its human rights obligations towards disabled people at this time. Mm. Uh, that's not in a way to slow things down. It's just to uh, help government take a human rights approach to um, its response at this time. Secondly, I've got a role around, you know, really being connected with the community. And so I've been doing that as best I can from my garage um, and really staying in touch with what's going on out there. And then thirdly, there's there's a role around holding government to account. And really what that means is just making sure that disabled people are not falling through the gaps um, mm. at this time. And, you know, we, we know that some are and there's a real potential uh, for that to happen. So it's really making sure that I am drawing that to government's attention. So, so those are sort of the, the three broad roles, if you like, uh, at, at this time. Thank you so much for that. So, so on that basis, I know my viewers and myself are really keen to know what do you understand about what's going on, on the ground? How much of that can you share with us today? I think it's really important that we all have a really good understanding of what's going on and I've been really pleased that you know people have shared their situations with me both at the individual level and then sort of more broadly what's going on within their community people have been staying in touch via social media via my email and text mm. and phone and, and it's been great because actually I can't do my job well unless I know what's happening so Absolutely. it's been great. Service providers have um, stayed in touch and various NGOs. So I'm feeling really well connected. Um, the, I think yeah, there are a number of things, Jade, that are going on. Um, one of the big issues, particularly a few days ago, but we're starting to see some movement on, has been around making sure that uh, community care workers, both in residential facilities and in the homes of disabled people have access to the personal protective equipment and you know that there were some real issues around that early on and uh, there's been some movement now to release that gear and make it available um, 
there have been issues around um, accessible transport and so uh, making sure that disabled people can get to their essential services. Access to food has become a real issue for a lot of New Zealanders and I'm acutely aware that in our community, particularly where you know there, there is that digital divide in many places, um, getting access to food uh, is a real issue. Um, another issue has just been the accessibility of communications and you know th there's work going on to take that general COVID-19 um, information and, and create accessible formats and make that available to people. I think one of the things that you know I'm really acutely aware of is that for a long time in New Zealand you know listeners will know and you and I both know that um, you know, the outcomes for disabled people have not been what they need to be. And at a time like this, the gaps really become quite clear. And, you know, you can't just put a Band-Aid over those gaps. You know, people have to work pretty hard to, to get what is needed to get done, done. And so people who might ordinarily be okay at this time you know, are struggling without access to respite care, behavioural support um, services, things like teacher aids. Um, so some of those ordinary supports that many in our community have, when they're not there at the moment, it really does create challenges for people. Right, and I suppose the core reason uh, why we reached out to you to have this conversation today was around that issue, those that would normally be okay, not being so okay. I've got a question about PPE. We can talk about that a little bit later, but I want to come squarely to your opinion on the government so far and whether you feel uh, they've responded appropriately to the needs of our community. Look, I think by and large, there is most definitely uh, a very open mind that I'm seeing. And, you know, I think at a time like this, the gaps, the existing gaps in infrastructure and service delivery and, and policies are, uh, are really starting to show. And I think agencies are becoming very aware that, well, actually, when you think about how do people get access to supermarkets at the moment? You know, that's quite challenging enough for most New Zealanders, but then you have to apply your mind to how disabled people might get access, you know, and that means that you know, not everyone can fill in an online shopping form, not everyone has access to the computer, not everyone has access to accessible transport at the moment. And so it's it's asking all those added questions that, um, you know, make it particularly challenging for disabled people at the moment. So what I'm seeing across government is um, most definitely an understanding of the really, really pressing issues that are affecting our community. And, you know, I think government's working pretty hard to resolve things for most New Zealanders, but some of those responses just can't come fast enough for our mm. community. So I think it's about you know, the, it's about pace. What I'm hopeful for, if there's a silver lining to to this situation, I'm hoping that the pace at which government agencies are now having to think about disability might continue in the future and that more people will be aware of, actually, you can't just take a universal approach and it will work for disabled people. You actually have to think a bit differently. And maybe the silver lining is that that thinking might continue into the future. Is there a real terms risk that if the health system becomes pressurised that disabled people will will inevitably be deprioritised? That's what I'm hearing in the community. People are feeling like that might be an issue if we don't get COVID-19 under wraps. I think that it's a fear which, um, you know, is has validity in terms of, you know, we've seen what's been happening in some other countries and, and how people uh, have been deprioritised. I think that, you know, we all need to make sure that doesn't happen mm -hmm. here. And, you know, if I sort of think about 
what the government have been saying um, around COVID-19, you know, that they've been talking about wanting to make sure that uh, people in our community and people over 70 and people with underlying health conditions um, are protected at this time. And so I think there's a very, a very genuine, um, uh, authentic approach to that. And, you know, I think we have to be really attuned to the fact, though, that there there will be pressure on the health system, I'm sure, as a result of this for years to mm. come. And, and, you know, we all need to make sure that, that that doesn't disproportionately impact us. I want to come to providers next, but but I want to ask first, um, what things are you talking about with decision makers? Because you would be one of the few people that would get access to them right now. Yeah, I... I in the early days it felt like a bit of scrambling um, <laughs> as, as everyone was but we've got some really good processes in place now for me to be able to escalate things at a really high level and I'm doing that in partnership with disabled people's organisations and the Office for Disability Issues the, the uh, three of us have a, a really good working relationship at this time around um, well at all times but just particularly right now okay. just around um, escalating things so the things that I have been talking a lot about has been uh, PPE, which we touched on, access to food, accessible transport, um, the accessibility of communications, and what are some of the options around um, respite care and access to mm. services like that. The other thing that I've also been talking about, and I met with ministers um, yesterday on actually, was my concern around violence and abuse at this time and as we know this is a topic which um you know I, i've is, is very uh, dear to me in terms of wanting to raise the prevalence and impact of violence and abuse on disabled people during normal times and you know at this particular time uh, i think you know there are a number of us who are are worried about the potential pressure and rise of, of violence and abuse and so I've been talking with ministers about what are some of the things in, you know, here and now that can be done to help protect people um, during this really challenging time. Really important, really important. Thank you yes. Commissioner. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about providers. Obviously they're under a lot of pressure. I'm told that something like this only comes around every hundred years or so. Um, in terms of how providers are responding, how do you feel about that? Before you go, I'll just say, you know, anecdotally, I'm hearing things like uh, support workers are not showing up or providers are losing their workforce to illness or simply wanting to self-isolate. What, what's your impression of how providers are responding at this time? Uh, look, I, I think listeners um, to this will, will have a, a better day-to-day -day sense of that than me. What I'm hearing is that, um, you know, service providers have also been under under immense challenge around um, protecting their own you know, workforce, but also uh, early on again in getting um, the protective equipment for staff. I certainly know in... Um, you know, meeting with the NZ DSN that, you know, that they're really, really committed to making sure that services are um, are running as best they can at this time, notwithstanding that, you know, of, of course there are challenges. I know that service providers early on were matching, um, you know, in their databases, um, you know, making sure that they were working closely with um, with the NASCs and with people and their families around, you know, those with high and, and complex needs and, and what was needed. Um, look, I'm sure things aren't perfect. Um, nothing is perfect at the moment. I really, really encourage people to um, contact their NASC, contact their service provider, um, contact the the Ministry of Health and I'd certainly you know welcome feedback directly to me about how that's going service providers are well connected 
reflected into, um, you know, trying to influence sort of government at the moment around what's what's needed. So, you know, the, the sort of situation that you, you describe and people not mm. turning up and lateness and, and things, um, you know, you people out there will know to what degree that's happening. I just encourage people to, um, you know, really bring that to the attention of NASCs and service providers. I know that the, you know, all I can say from the meetings I've been in is that the intention is, you know, is a really good one. I know service providers want to do their best. I know they're under, cons you know, constraint. And I think everyone, you know, we are literally in this together and we, we need to, you know, call out when things aren't working, um, but also, you know, be, be mindful of that everyone is working in a really pressured environment. For sure. Thank you for that. Um, let, let's go back to PPE. I know you touched on that. Your your message earlier was that actually the situation seems to be improving. I'm hearing stories about people having to sew their own masks. They may not be to regulation. Not sure how much help they would be to people if they're sewing them themselves. And these articles about making sure disabled people don't have worse health outcomes because they don't have access to PPE. So can you just clarify what the real term situation is around PPE? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Um, what you describe is uh, families um, uh, who are, you know, I've been, been given stories of families who are looking for looking after disabled children and there are multiple carers coming in on any one day and they haven't had the gear. Um, other examples of um, carers who have been into multiple other homes during the day and then come into the home of a, of a disabled person. Absolutely. And, you know, I've been very, very concerned about that. Hence it was, you know, for the, for the first couple of days was the issue that um, I and others, the DPOs and and uh, and service providers themselves and many others were working hard to to change. What I understand now is that um, the Ministry of Health is working directly with DHBs to get that gear out, and there have been public statements around that. I'm gathering it's going to it takes a little while for that gear to reach people, but at least that decision to release that gear has uh, has occurred, and I'm really pleased about that because. You know, we we um, need to make sure that disabled people are feeling comfortable with carers coming into their homes with the right equipment, and also that um, carers feel safe in, in going into you know multiple other homes and things, and then into the homes of a disabled person. So, when I say that I think things are moving, uh, I'm sure it's going to take you know a couple of days for that to to actually um, hit the ground, so to speak. But I know that you know, those public decisions have been made to release that gear. Awesome. So initially we all know from a message from the Prime Minister and I think Ashley as well, that initially PPE for support workers wasn't a priority, that they were squarely focused on the front line. Were you part of the changing of the mind on that one, would you say? Um, I couldn't take credit for that all myself. <laughs> I, I certainly uh, raised at the highest levels. I wrote to ministers and the Director General of Health um, and, and consistently, uh, and, I, and I spoke on um, to the media about, about the issue. Uh, I also know that uh, it was also raised by others. So I think, you know, a, a, a collective effort um, you know, was was able to. You know, we we were all able to affect that change. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, just checking my notes here. In terms of the gaps, because you're obviously talking about lots of good things happening right now in terms of how we're responding for disabled people. If you wouldn't mind, just um, indulging us. What 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 do you think some of the gaps still are uh, in terms of taking care of our most vulnerable? Uh, people. I think um, the, the the issues which um, I, I know are being worked on, but 
you know, there is not necessarily resolution across all of these areas. But I know, um, you know, things like access to respite care, what are the options there um, for for people? Uh, what options are, you know, there? we know there are existing um, gaps in um, service delivery agencies, in relation to family violence and you know um, we know that, that those gaps exist now and so will there be um, a response which can provide much more intensive wraparound support from a disability perspective. Um, access to food is absolutely being worked on at central government and local government but I know that there are still people who are contacting me about access to food and look access to food is one of the most basic human needs and so i'm I really Absolutely really agree. encourage people to yep. look at the covid19 website um there's information in there around accessing food and there's a number of um hotlines and uh places to call so i really encourage people to to be aware of those um and accessibility of Communications, you know, I know um, DPOs and and are working incredibly hard to get accessible formats of information. Um, my senior comms advisor is part of that team in um, helping create accessible formats. But you know, again, um, time is of the essence, and it's trying, you know, now to take a much more all of government approach to communications. So originally DPOs um, and, and others were working on health information and now there's a, a need to create accessible formats across a broader range of information that's coming out of government so you know really good levels of, of awareness of these things and it, it, it's just the time that it takes to to put all of that into action. I've got to say and I can't speak for the deaf community because I'm not a member but I have to say I've been really impressed with how visible at least the sign language interpreters have been as of late. Yeah, I, look, it's great. It, it um, you know, it, it's such a positive image of inclusion when you see a, a person um, who's using New Zealand Sign Language next to the Prime Minister and next to the Director General of Health and I think that the ongoing challenge is to make sure that the rest of our community can access information so that, you know, there's easy read formats and formats for people who are blind or have low vision um, and, you know, getting those formats um, out. But you're right, it, it's, it's great to see New Zealand Sign Language being used. Thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of our time together. I, I've got an extra one for you. Something I've only just been made aware of. Uh, the Ministry of Justice recently released some guidance around um, separated families being able to continue uh, contact relationships where there might be a parenting order. I, I'm hearing that there are some issues with the actual execution of that where disabled people might need support workers in the home and a feeling that support workers uh, may may contaminate, for a lack of a better word, the children involved. Have you been across that issue at all? No, that one is new to me. I have been aware of the ministry's guidance around um, separated families, but not that there was that particular uh, concern from the disability sure. community. So, so sure. thank you for letting me know that. No, that's no worry. And finally, I just wanted to give you a platform and a stage, I suppose, to deliver whatever message you'd like to to my audience here today. Oh, thanks, Jade. Look, I, I, you know, we're in some really challenging times. I think our community um, often faces a disproportionate burden at the best of times, and we need to make sure that our community is not... Uh, facing an even more disproportionate burden at this time and I think you know the spotlight is really being shone on the um, gaps that that exist and you know I, I feel a sense of positivity in seeing how um, those 
you know, those um, gaps are being seen at the highest levels. And I, I think, you know, my, my role here is to keep um, feeding information through and encouraging pace at getting those things resolved. Um, I really encourage people to look at that COVID-19 website if you can. Um, I encourage you to, you know, um, look at websites like, um, I'm just looking for the name of it, but IHC and Carers New Zealand just recently released it. Um, and, you know, um, raising issues there. Please keep raising issues with me. Um, I really need to have a good sense of what's happening out there. Uh, I know that it can feel like a long time at the moment uh, between raising things and things getting resolved. Um, but please keep raising things through your NASC, through your DHB, through your service provider, your support worker. Um, and please keep letting me know what's going on. It helps me do my job much better. Um, and, and um, you know, let, let's make sure we really look after our community as, as best we all can through this. I'm going to say that I got a sharp prod in my shoulder from my producer. We do have one question uh, from the audience, if I could spare a bit more of your time to, <laughs> sure. to ask, that, ask <laughs> that one. So it's around uh, civil defence emergency plans. In the future, are these going to be looked into beforehand? There's a concern that uh, with these plans, disabled people are not considered at all. Do you have a response to that right now? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, again, I think this is something which, um, you know, a time like a time like this, when you need to put these plans in place, it becomes very real uh, in terms of where there are gaps. Definitely on my radar. I haven't raised it yet. I know that the civil defence messaging um, that's going out we do have opportunities to feed messages through there and and i will do that and i've just made a note of uh, to, to raise to raise this oh that's fantastic and my producer just wants to say one thing to you really quick <laughs> hopefully you're not fangirling live on stream but hi paula <laughs> i just really want to say thank you so much and um You've given me some reassurance because um, I actually had to go out the other day and it was very scary in the sense of I went to the supermarket and no one was respecting um, distance, not even the workers. Um, yes, I'm blind and low vision, but there's a thing called Facebook, FaceTime. So, um, yeah, it was very scary for the fact that the people were tending were not respecting distance and then the people working there were not respecting distance so it's great to know that there's a hotline and um great to know that because we've got no one in our house that to go out and do groceries and it's still so hard with those slots so i really appreciate the work that you're doing yeah no no thank you and i i definitely the supermarket slots i think you know supermarkets have been doing a good job to try and make make food accessible um available rather but uh people are telling me that those slots can be hard to yep. to get definitely so you know i think we need to keep raising these issues and um you know just because then you know people are aware at, at high levels that, that there are issues uh, doesn't mean they'll be resolved overnight so we do need to keep that momentum on and certainly, um, you know, there, there, there are a number of us who are doing that. So please keep in touch with me and let me know what's happening. Um, and, awesome. and I'll do, I, do my best to, uh, to do my role well. That's Thank really you. great. Just finally from me, I really do want to acknowledge that your team was super responsive. I think I got a response like straight away when I reached out to you. So I appreciate your openness to the interview and for your team being as responsive as they were thank you very much kia ora thanks jade and, and thanks everyone really appreciate your time today paula and we hope to have you on again later when, right. when we're not in a crisis perhaps yes <laughs> <laughs>
right, thank you. That'll be great. Good seeing you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Paula. Bye.